Hi, everyone. Welcome to this third and final interview on the cost of control. If you are just joining us, we have been doing kind of a, a deeper dive into the topic of my forthcoming book, The Cost of Control, and looking at this idea that whenever we try to control something that God has not given us to control, it's not just that we fail to do this, but it actually costs us in the process. And so with this final topic, we are going to be looking at reputation. What is the cost of trying to control what people think about us? And I'm really excited about this final conversation. And so without further ado, join me for my interview with Beth Moore. Beth, thanks for being with me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm really excited about this conversation. So I wanna dive into this, this pain point of not being able to control what people think about you. And if I'm being honest, this is a struggle that I thought I would have graduated from at this I'm point I'm not in sure my life. we ever completely graduate <laughs> from this one, Sharon. I'm not real sure we do. But if I'm being honest, when I look back, really the struggle has just evolved mm -hmm. into different forms throughout yes. my life. And so I'm curious for you if if that is the case where you can look back and see this is something that has evolved, it's taken mm. different forms, or for you, if it's really just been one form, like you have this one consistent thorn in the flesh struggle that has followed you throughout your life in ministry. Now, I'd say there's more of a morphing, but I will tell you that, thank God, it got better through the years and through the decades rather than more intense, and I'm gonna tell you why, because it started at the top, I mean at the most controlling you could possibly be because I don't know how much of my background you know, Sharon, but I come from an abuse background. Mm -hmm. I was abused not at church mm -hmm. like some people have mm -hmm. tragically experienced. My church was my safe place. Mm -hmm. My home was my unsafe mm -hmm. place, and I was abused within the four walls of my home. Mm -hmm. Very, very unstable home. And I've said to anyone who would listen, I was loved within my home, and I was also abused within my home. It was just all the things, all the things that would set you up for the most insecurity. Mm -hmm. And I was raised in a small Arkansas town, a college town, mm -hmm. so that makes it a little bit different, but we were in a town where everyone went to church and everyone knew everyone. Mm -hmm. And my family, we were generational Arkansans, even from that region. Mm -hmm. And so all of this was going on in my home, not just the abuse, but just the chaos, mm -hmm. the relational chaos, my parents were a mess. And we lived across, we lived in the outskirts of town when I was a little girl, but we had moved into town by the time I was in elementary. And by the time I was in middle school and high school, I was only having to walk across the street mm -hmm. to school. We lived right across the street from the high school. Mm -hmm. So I would have to become a different person from the time I walked out my front door, understand, my front door opened to the side door of the high school. So I began the transformation process. From the moment that I closed the door behind me until I walked into that high school, I had to become a different person. And I remember being a young woman and saying to the Lord, and I could still get a lump in my throat thinking about it because it was such an earnest question, am I a hypocrite? if who I'm acting like I am is who I really want to be. Hmm. Because I, and of course the answer is yes, mm -hmm. but also the compassion of the Lord upon someone going, I'm so messed up, mm -hmm. but I, I love you, I, I want, I mean, I had been raised in church, I was, I was enamored with Jesus in, in kind of a, an, an unusual way mm -hmm. from, from childhood. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to love him, and I wanted to be a good girl so badly, mm -hmm. and I was just so messed up. And so that, I began controlling that mm -hmm. from the start, from, from early adolescence, because I, I don't speak for all abuse victims, but Sharon, you, it's something you do. Uh, it, it would be, your default would be to fake it, yeah. to decide who you need to be, because you don't want them to know mm -hmm. who you really are and the shame that you yeah. really do feel. But the thing is, it bleeds out. It, it can't help it. It's, gonna, it's, it's like coming out of your pores. Sooner or later, it's either going to gash out or it's going to seep out. But whatever is in there is coming out. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes. Oh. So I started that way, very, yeah. very much trying to control it. And I was outgoing, so that part of my personality was very, very authentic. Mm -hmm. But as far as that everything was good, everything that was, was good, I was a fairly successful student. I was successful in extracurricular activities, all of those things, just control it, control it, control mm -hmm. it, don't let anybody know. Mm -hmm. And so that was very much how I started. So that is different. That's a different kind of struggle than growing up, going into ministry. Mm -hmm. And anyone who has had leadership in ministry knows that that can also feel like a little bit of a tightrope at times. Yes, yes. Because that it's a different type of image management. And I actually, I do want to come back to that struggle of your childhood as well. I want to, that's so tender. I'm, I do want to circle back around to that for anyone who is in that place right yes. now but just as an adult we experience people taking our names and their mouths yes. you know in in different circumstances for ministry if someone has an opinion about a decision that you've made or a thing that you've taught or a way that you lead and and people you know go and, and talk to other people and just the pain of that but but people outside of ministry experience this as well. Yes, you know, they do. when they're yes, they going through mm. a divorce yes. and you have done nothing wrong. Right. But there are mutual friends who think away about you yes. because of what they have been told. Yes. And so I'm curious if you have felt that pain as an adult or if you worked through it as you grew up and, and it has felt less of a pain now. Okay, now I've had that struggle all along, but I will tell you that my world began when I was closer to your age and even a little younger than that. Mm -hmm. The world was very, very different. In other words, I had my community at church that I served. I was already very much in ministry. But the part of ministry that I was in, if there was a lot of misunderstanding, it was fairly reachable to try to bring some kind of explanation into it. Everything changed when we got social media. Everything. Mm -hmm. Because we can't control all of this information. In the old days when you used to just be able to call a church and go, I think that I have left the wrong impression here. Or maybe I left the right impression. Maybe what I need to do is tell you, man, I'm so sorry. This is a place where I really need change in my life. Because here's the thing, Sharon, as far as controlling an image, I came from such a mess mm -hmm. that one of the things that I had to let go of was needing to look all put together for people because I just couldn't keep it going. Mm -hmm. At some place, part of my freedom became owning it mm -hmm. because there was no other way uh, to, uh, to manage it, to sustain it. You can't sustain that false image uh, forever. Yeah. But that to try to get where you're at peace with your reputation mm -hmm. when you see, I remember reading one time, and I, I don't go looking at all, ever. It was very accidental that I found it, but that I had been a, a cocaine addict, and they, they were rather uh, compassionate mm -hmm. about it, but the fact is, I, I had never once taken cocaine, not, not once. And I thought, this, this, this is so strange, and that it would be just all sorts of things that had just ballooned. Maybe there was a, a little bit of an ember in that, but it, in whatever it was that they were saying, but then it had become a forest fire. And so it was just the strangest thing. And I kept thinking over and over that these were the kinds of things that would help me along the way, is that Jesus made himself of no reputation. You know, just tried over and over to be able to say that he is responsible for my image mm -hmm. for my I'm to bear his image he's got to bear mine whatever that is whatever that looks like whatever and you know also Sharon oh my goodness you know I sit and visit with you at at just about to turn 65 mm -hmm. so imagine this many years of ministry imagine this many books which I I'm not sure I could count to you right now somewhere mm -hmm. thir somewhere around 30 mm -hmm. This many times of speaking, this many times of teaching, 
can you imagine all the things that I wish I had said differently or done differently? And when I look at the early curriculum, how many just, just exclamation marks I used. It was, I was so enthusiastic. <laughs> Every <laughs> sentence ended with an exclamation. Yeah. I just was so enthusiastic yeah. about the Lord. But what, all I have when I look back at it is, well, bless her heart, that was her. What bothers me most to look back at now mm -hmm. is when I know that that was not genuine. Mm -hmm. If I can see something in myself, even in a, in a, in a video, e in anything where I could see that I sort of made a shift in that mm -hmm. moment, that really is what I'm most embarrassed of, mm -hmm. where I was mm -hmm. controlling of it. Mm -hmm. Because where you were just you, what, 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 what can I do? Yeah. Well, looking back to those seasons where you were trying to control how people yes. saw you. Yes. So my book, which is coming out later this summer, is looking at this topic of the cost of control. And how I arrived at it is that whenever I was struggling with control and someone would say, you, you need to just let go, you know, you need to surrender, this was not helpful to me at all. <laughs> And do explain why, because I love this. I it was not this. helpful to me at all. And I don't know if this is my personality, if I'm just like a contrarian person, but what I finally had to arrive at was the realization that when I was trying to control, and this goes all the way back to Genesis 3, you know, what we're doing, anytime we try to control something that God has not given us to control is we are reenacting Genesis 3. That That's is so the blueprint for human brokenness. I think you're right. And so all the fallout that happened immediately after Adam and Eve grabbed that fruit, the shame, you know, the anxiety, the yes. division between them, you know, we reenact that every time we control something we've not been given to control. And Great. so I finally reached this, this point of realizing, oh, it, it's not just that I don't have control, it's that when I try to control something, I will break something. Absolutely. And so the question is, what will I break? Right. You know, when I'm trying to control my husband, how, not if, how am I breaking my marriage yes. right now and yes. my relationship with him? And so, again, I don't know if this is my personality where I'm just more motivated by punishment. I don't know what it is, but the idea that the idea that this will cost me was really clarifying. Absolutely. And in helping me to realize this will this will not accomplish what no. I think it will accomplish. It will burn you over and over and over again. Yeah. And so my question for you, looking back on your life, those those moments when you were contorting yourself, you mm -hmm. know, when you were mm -hmm. changing who you were, being a less honest version of yourself, what was the cost for you personally? One of the things that I will say down the line, and this is looking over decades of life, mm -hmm. is that anything we try to maintain maintain control of mm -hmm. that you, just as you said anything that is not ours to go we're going to control it we're going to we are going I, I could say this to anyone listening anyone across the board the thing of it is you're going to lose control of it right mm -hmm. uh, life will see to it and if I may be so bold God will see to it because he's not going to let us be little little junior gods he's not mm -hmm. he's not going to do it mm -hmm. he's not going to do it so, but life is just mean like that anyway. It's, it's coming for us. It, it's absolutely coming for us. And brokenness is going to come. So what's real is what's going to come out. Mm -hmm. So sooner or later, and th that was the thing, when you get burned by something over and over, you finally go, okay, this is not worth it. Right. Mm -hmm. For one thing, let's, let's do visit that. Even it, it could be children. It could be uh, a group that you are for whatever reason, supervising, it could be a workplace, it could be marriage, whatever it is, dealing with an elderly parent, whatever it may be. But when we get in a situation where we're trying to control another person, mm -hmm. the, the thing of it is that we're not going to be able to do it right. and we're going to make ourselves crazy right. trying. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely crazy yes. trying. Mm -hmm. My husband is the kind that the more you try to control him, the less he will be controlled. Right. One of the best things, and I don't know what Ike is like, I don't know him personally, but one of the best things God ever did for me, and I have not considered this a favor uh, at all times, but Keith cannot bear pretense. Huh. He can't bear it. Yeah. It's for Keith, any kind of 
putting on, like if there was any kind of change, even between leaving home and walking in the church, Keith was just not going to, he was not going to go with that. He was not going to play. So he almost made it where pretty early on as a couple, we were just like, I, I would always feel like in our couple's department when we were really young, I always thought, well, we're the ones everybody prays for the most because, and I always thought it was because we were the most messed up. I really believe now it was because Keith was the most honest. That he would just say, well, you know, I'm dealing with this. I'm, he just was like that. But uh, I had just learned in, in over and over and over and over trying to control the whole thing and trying to control it in a way to think, but I, I could make you happier. This is what would make you happier. I, I want to control my children because I just know that this obedient life would make them happier. You know, all of this thing that we, that we do uh, to rationalize our control of other people, it just simply does not work. And then the people that we've tried to control come to resent us so right. much. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't, it's not just that it creates anxiety in you because, you know, when I'm trying to control what people think of me, I'm the one that lays awake at night, you know, thinking about 100%. it. 100%. You know? But it also strains yes, our relationships. It does. People are on to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. They really are. And, yeah. you know, I just finally got tired. And there, there, I, I can't say that everything about aging is good mm-hmm. because, obviously, there are the aches and pains of it. There are all, all the things that go along with it. But this part is wonderful. There is a passage of time where these battles have not been won, Mm -hmm. but they are not as fierce. And I want to tell you, Sharon, one of the ways that I came to greater peace, understand, I'm going to say like the Apostle Paul in in, um, in Philippians 3, I have not attained this, but this is what I continually press on toward, that that my, my freedom is in knowing that This is just the real me, that coming especially into the world of social media and being able to look at who you're not as well as who you are, Mm -hmm. as your generation came up and you guys were far, you and several of your your peers were so much better trained Mm -hmm. and academically you were more prepared. My generation, we didn't even have a paradigm. We didn't, we had, I hate to say this, we had no idea what we were doing. I loved the scriptures. I I wanted people to love it. But you begin to look around you and and you begin to have to accept what you do not have, that I can't, I can't compete with that. Mm -hmm. The best thing I can do is what, what do I bring to the mix? And be true to that. Mm -hmm. Be true to that. And that is what gives me peace to lay my head on the pillow at night that I didn't, that just like, Lord, you control it. You control everything that concerns me. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to be as true to you and as true to who I really am, even if I have to watch myself be imitated, because you don't have the kind of personality that is very easy to imitate. I really do. <laughs> Between my accent, all my, all my physical yeah. things, the way I do things, the way I say things. I have seen myself, and in, yeah. some, t- in, in some occasions done in good humor, mm-hmm. and in other cases done very, you know, just like breaks your heart, and you think, oh, you feel so ashamed of yourself, and like, that is what I look like. That is what I look like. That is what people think. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it's, all, you know, I tell you, that, that's me. Mm-hmm. I, I'll so often... Right at the top of my notes, Sharon, before I speak, I'll try to tell myself to do certain things. Don't do this so much. Don't just stay closer to the podium. Don't, you know, just tone down. Well, I never do because 20 minutes in, I've lost myself in it. And then it's just, but the comfort is, "Mm, you know, that's that's me. Mm -hmm. And... I also want to say this. I wouldn't want our conversation to end without saying this because I I think this will matter to someone. One of the things about it happening to you a lot where you are criticized 
a lot, like it's on a, just a bigger scale where you run into it constantly. Part of it you accept after a while that this is the way it's going to be. I'm never going to make everybody happy. I'm never going to get people to approve of me. So I might as well just be who I am before the Lord and stop trying to control it. Mm-hmm. And no, I, we have to be spirit-led. At what point do we say publicly, this just isn't true? Right. Yeah. And at what point do we say, mm-hmm. I don't know what to tell you. And for me, one of those things has been, if I've said it enough, mm-hmm. I'm not saying it again. Yeah. If I just keep seeing the same accusation, mm-hmm. And I know I've done the best I can to clear it up. So that leads me to another question I actually wanted to ask you. So Proverbs 22 says that a good name is to be chosen over great wealth. And I I think that raises a really interesting Mm -hmm. question Mm -hmm. for this conversation is, okay, what is our responsibility in our reputation? You know, versus what is not our responsibility? What can we let go of? And, And I'm thinking, again, just of anyone who's in the thick of it right now where they have really tried to be above reproach. They've tried to live with yes. integrity. Yes. And yet, yes. you know, people think a way about them. What would you say? One of the things that I would want to point out that is so much a part of our current culture is how easy it is to conflate and to blend together, to fuse the idea of a good name and a good brand. So... Let's pull out of that yeah. because there is no part of that. I'm not saying that there's not, there are not emblems, there are not all sorts of icons that may represent uh, a ministry or a place of business or a kind of work. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about personal branding, yeah. making a brand of our name. I just cannot say enough mm-hmm. that that is the absolute antithesis mm-hmm. of what we've been called to do. Mm-hmm that we, one of the things that we have this side, now that the wisdom of of Proverbs is still very, very much the wisdom that we have today. And it's living in such a way that is, for to have a good name in uh, in, uh, biblical terms, especially under the Old Covenant, would have been to have been a, a good neighbor, to have been honest in the way you dealt with people, to be the things that were beneficial and true to God and neighbor. So all of those things still go, but we get over into the New Testament and suddenly it becomes, who, who is Apollos? Who is, who is Cephas? Who, who is Paul? This, this is Christ. This is Christ. And so even though there is that, that we, we would want so much to have a sound a sound reputation yeah. that people that we would have uh, built some kind of integrity that people would know. One of the reliefs we have, we do the best we can to live lives of integrity and character. But what we also have, I come from a lot of a lot of baggage, mm-hmm. so I have not always lived my life with integrity. I look back over my shoulder and I am horrified by some of the things in my past. So what do I have? Well, I have the cross of Christ. I have the cross of Christ. It's got to be that, okay, my name, I have sullied my name, but his is a name above every name. That is the name I, I want to live for. That is the name I want to have been on my lips. And if that is the name I leave people with when my life is over, I I want you to know something, Sharon. Knowing what we were going to talk about in this, I asked God, please, to guard me from being untrue or false in any way. And so I want to say to you, I know this sounds like spiritual talk, but I could not mean it more. Just this battle, just being decades older and seeing what this all comes to because I've been thinking about it a lot. I have some friends that are my age and and older. And one of the things that we are seeing from the Lord is that he allows us to become less and less impressed with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's a relief in a way I don't know how to explain. Mm -hmm. And so the sooner to release that, Mm -hmm. one of the things that, First Peter chapter 4 talks about is that when anyone 
suffers according to the will of God. Let them just entrust themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. What I would say to anybody that you feel like your reputation really took a terrible hit and that some of it may have been true, but that certainly wasn't true. What do you do? It's not going to be words because words are almost meaningless now. It's going to be time and just doing the next right thing, just doing good and just hanging in there and living past the past and uh, and growing. I think that that one of the things that we have to uh, give ourselves the right to do is that, and this is why we don't want to make an image for ourselves, because we want the ability to change. We don't want to be frozen in time. I don't want to be frozen even into that old image. I I just got to go with what is true, and that's our relief. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there is a spiritual stronghold that only the Holy Spirit can destroy to some extent. Yes. So this needs to be tackled in prayer. We yes. need to just be asking. And I, I really, the, the, for me, what ultimately has really helped me was not, there, there wasn't anything specific. It was one of those things where I was driving in the car one day, wrestling again with, you know, some people that were unhappy with yes. me about something, even though I felt like I had, you know, honored scripture and know, taught, you know, know theologically. Sharon. And and I had this moment where I really think it was the Holy Spirit where I realized, you know what? I'm not getting anyone to heaven. Like, no one is getting into heaven by my name. No. You know? I, That's like, so if, good. If people leave our church, if they stop reading my books, whatever, but they still love Jesus, that's it. That's a win. That's it. And I, in that moment, I felt like the Holy Spirit just sort of unlocked that in some sense. And so that's one thing I want to encourage if anyone's just in the thick of it right now, that, that prayer and, and just like you said, time is, is so critical yes. and, and it, we can't shortcut it, unfortunately, no, we can't. in some way. No, we can't. But I, you just said a very key thing, and I, I'm so glad that we wouldn't have missed this part of the conversation because one of the biggest motivators for either one of us and for so many people that we would be able to sit in a circle alongside, when you come to love the Lord Jesus and you have a, you have a prayer life, it doesn't have to look like Elizabeth Elliot's or anybody else's, but you, you have a prayer life. You, you, you walk with Jesus to the degree that you, that you know how. Uh, one of the reasons why you want to be able to be true is because you can feel it when you're not. Right. I don't like that feeling. I don't like the feeling that, that with the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us, I don't like the feeling I get when I know that just was so much bull. Right. You know what I'm saying? Or that like, uh, I, I, I don't like that feeling. So I, I, like, I like to know that there's not going to be some kind of uh, uh, boundary to the Holy Spirit's filling in me. And uh, so that's really what's key is that he's just not stifled uh -huh. because, you know, he's not obligated himself to guard our image. Right. He's obligated himself to guard yeah. the true yeah. us. And so... <laughs> Going back to why I wrote the book in the first place, like I just said, I can't short, we can't shortcut the Holy no. Spirit. But my hope, and, and part of the reason I ask you to share your own story, my hope is by putting our finger on what happens to you, what is the cost of contorting yourself, yes. of shape-shifting, whatever yes. it is to control what people think of you. I want to look at you and I want to say, you don't have to live that way. Yes. And that Christ came and died and was raised for you to not live yes. that way. Yes. And so I'm just so prayerful that, that if any of you are in that place right now where you are laying awake at night or you are shape-shifting or you are straining your relationships because you're trying so desperately to control what people are thinking of you that we understand we have been, we have been there, but you don't have to live that way. And I pray this is a moment where you can hear those words and just be set free. But I do want to circle back to what you initially shared about yourself when you were younger and, you know, walking across the street and just changing yes. because I'm sure there are people who are listening right now and that is their story. Mm -hmm. 
And so I was wondering if you would mind just speaking to them, if, if there's any to. word of freedom that you could speak to them. Okay, now here's what I would want to say to you. If you have anything like my background, anything that was built into your life, whether it's in childhood or, or adolescence or adulthood, anything that was built into your life that made you feel like you needed to hide, that you needed to keep it covered. It can be all sorts of things. It could be, uh, it could be mental illness. It could be that you had a time of tremendous stability that you look back over and you think, oh, you know, such an embarrassing time of my life. Whatever it is, anything that makes us feel like we need to hide, I want to speak into that. In, and I also want to speak into if you feel like, no, no, what, what my problem was wasn't something that happened to me. It's stuff that I did myself, and I feel like I have to hide from my old self. Listen, I've been through all of that because, yes, I was a victim of abuse in my home, but then I made every disastrous decision you can imagine. Every single time I came up to multiple choice answers, I would choose D for destruction over and over again. So I want to say to you, one of the things that really, really helped me was that I would remind myself the power of the gospel. Sometimes when we're in the, uh, Christian community, we can get something put on us that makes us feel like we, we needed to have been perfect and we need other people to think we've always had it together. Go to the gospels. And you don't feel that way. You see who he came to. One of the things I've had to remind myself about through so many years, because I look back over my shoulder at so much failure in my past, and what I have to remind myself is, wait, the great physician came for the sick. I was sick. I needed help. He came. Jesus came to die for sinners. Well, I am a sinner I was a sinner, and I will be a sinner. If I go back to the Gospels, that if I'm just in Christian environments, I might feel like I have to have all that stuff put on me that I feel like I cannot live up to. When I go to the Scriptures and I see who Jesus was drawn to, I, I see that, that he ministered, that his heart was moved with compassion, I find peace there, and I, fi I find that I can be myself, and I can... I can own my own story, and that's where I want this to begin with you. That Learn to be who you get to be with him, with others. And you may be the only one in your circle of influence that is willing to do it. Somebody told me a couple of days ago, because I apologized to someone online for having hurt their feelings, they said, boy, that's so refreshing. I never see any leader just go, I'm so sorry. I thought, what, what an odd thing to be able to say of us that we won't be earnest enough to go, I own that. I have said so many stupid things, and I am so sorry. What, what does that hurt us to do? To just learn to be before the Lord, this is who I am. This is the power of the cross in my life. This is the power of the resurrection that even after all the mistakes I've made, I can still get up in the morning being hated, I can still get up in the morning. It's resurrection life, and it enables me then to go out into the world and to be able to still be that person. And so I, I, I want to pray that over you, uh, if, I, if I may, if I may pray for, for them, Sharon, but I just cannot uh, encourage you enough to find that place of your full acceptance and belovedness in Christ, that see yourself on the gospel page, see yourself there, and you will know he would have been drawn to you. Whatever it is you're wanting to hide behind, he came to take that down so that you can be the true you. And it is in that reflection, when we put away, okay, okay, remember Second Corinthians chapter 3, when it says, with unveiled faces we are transformed from glory to glory? We try to put that veil back on over and over again, but it's with that unveiled face that I'm, I'm going to be true. This is who I am. I'm just going to go ahead and own it. That is the face that reflects Jesus, not the image, not the veil, not the mask. It's the real live face that has been uncovered before Jesus that then reflects him out in the world.
So if I may, I pray for you. Yeah, I wanted. I'd asked Beth if she would mind praying, and you know, I just asked you to speak to a very specific group. But really, wherever you are, if you find yourself in that place where you feel helpless because you can't control what people think of you, and and you have tried to honor God, and you've tried to be obedient and have integrity, but you know that that is not the story that that everyone hears, and it is so painful. We think of this as being like a high school struggle, but it it continues to be painful, and Jesus knows. And so if that is where you are, I'm I'm gonna encourage you, even if you're watching this in your home, in your car, wherever, if that is where you are, to just open your hands and receive the, the presence of God as, as Beth closes us in prayer yes. together. Oh, I'd love to do that. Our Lord, we're so grateful for the privilege of prayer that really is where everything happens that gives us the courage to go out and be who you've created us to be. And mm-hmm. so I thank you for that. I thank you, Father, that we can be absolutely certain. So can every uh, viewer, so can every listener, absolutely certain that you hear us when we pray because we come to you in the name of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And we do ask you, Father, there is no place that we can come that Jesus cannot understand, that you sent him to this world to take on human flesh and blood, Mm -hmm. to be tempted in the same ways we are, and to go through the same things that we do, and yet, of course, him without sin. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking, Father, how often he was misunderstood. And we know that, Father. We know that feeling of just being misunderstood, to be able to fellowship with you in that suffering Jesus, that we'd be able to bring it to you and go, Lord, I I just ask you, here it is. Here it is. You know what I'm dealing with. Would you just, like, you, if it can be fixed, you fix it. If it can't, then I'll fellowship with you in it as one who was uh, misunderstood. Lord, I'm remembering when I came to you, oh, day after day after day, and just was uh, so um, so beaten up by criticism from my own uh, familiar world in Christian community. And I remember, Father, saying to you, but this, your, your word said that we would be hated by the world, but Lord, this this isn't the world. I've never been treated by the world the way I was treated by, by some of my own people. And Father, you, you reminded me that the same was true for Jesus, that it was his own people. That's what made it so personal. And so, Father, I want to pray for those that have been hurt and injured by their own people. That Jesus, that's We can enter into that with you. You know that better than anyone. We can fellowship with you in that. We can bring it to you knowing that that's exactly what you dealt with. And uh, we can find ministry and comfort in you. Lord, I just ask you to give each of us the courage to be who you created us to be. Lord, that is as corny as it might sound, there's no one else, Lord. Um, exactly like this person, Father, that sits before you and brings all of her uh, experience, all her DNA, all her personality, all her skill, all her education, all her lack of education, everything we bring to the mix, Lord. There's just, she's it, she's it for that exact mix. And so I pray, Father, you would give her courage to brave being herself in you and acknowledging that she is an image bearer of he who loves her so. Thank you, Lord. I I wanna say this, Father, as I close in prayer. I thank you, Lord, that moments do come. I love what Sharon said earlier about being in the car and that it wasn't that it fixed everything. It was just that that little bit of insight began that journey. I'm I'm gonna believe that for somebody today, Lord, that this moment, that this moment, that they don't even know why. I'm like, they might say, well, it wasn't even that big a deal. I didn't even get that much out of it. But somehow you timed it right now. This is a new start. This is a new era. This is a new era of authenticity when his name becomes everything that my name is about. In the glorious and holy and beautiful and saving, redeeming, healing name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.